Hi everybody, greetings from a very cold, wet and uh, wintry Cape Town. Oh, it's very unpleasant outside there at the moment. We've uh, got quite a bit of early Rhodesian history to get through, so uh, let's just make a start, shall we? We can't spend too much time on Percy Crewe, but at the same time we cannot exactly ignore the man. You may recall that uh, Loban Gula had asked him to take a delegation to Cape Town and from thence to London, uh, seek an audience with uh, Queen Victoria and present her with a letter from him. And this letter essentially said that uh, King Lobengula was not impressed uh, with her British South Africa company and would she kindly take steps to remove them from Matabili land. Uh, words to that effect. And he also said to Percy, uh, Percy, there are three white men left here in Bulawayo and I'm, I'm not going to let them go. I'm holding them hostage until you return here, um, having safely delivered my letter to uh, to the Queen. So uh, Percy went to say goodbye to these uh, three men, James Dawson, the storekeeper, uh, a Mr. Usher and a Mr. Fairbairn. And it was a very sad occasion, uh, almost a, a time of uh, tears. And Percy reassured them. He said, look, I'm, I will not abandon you. I will definitely come back. Uh, be reassured on, on that point. He said, Al although I said that, and I really meant it, in my heart, I did not believe that I'd ever see those three gentlemen alive again. And so uh, he sets out with a delegation consisting of uh, three African men, uh, an old Nduna by the name of Mshetty, uh, another man by the name of John, and a third fellow by the name of James Makunga. Now James was a very well-read man. In fact, he had written the letter uh, as uh, Lobengula had dictated it to him. And uh, he was, uh, I suppose you would call, the official interpreter of the party. So uh, the three of them set off uh, in quite a rush. And um, they get to Tati. Now, uh, Tati is a place on the border of uh, Betjuana land and Matabili land. And from there they travel safe and they arrive at a, at a place called Palapi. And at Palapi, uh, Percy Crew goes to see the uh, senior official there, a man by the name of John Moffat. Uh, Mr. Moffat, uh, Percy says, uh, I'm on official business uh, from King Lobengula. I have three African gentlemen that I am asked to accompany to London. Uh, there is a letter which needs to be handed to Her Majesty. Uh, but Mr. Moffat, surely, sir, um, I cannot be expected to bear the cost uh, of this mission. And I've come to you with a request. Can the Imperial Government not pay for this? And uh, Moffat says, well, look, I'll tell you what. Hang around here for a few days. I'll send a wire down to um, to Cape Town and find out what the instructions are. And Moffat does so. A while later, he calls Percy in and he says, um, you are to proceed uh, with these uh, men to Cape Town. And there I want you to report directly to Sir Henry Locke, the High Commissioner. And would you kindly explain to him everything as you have to me. And uh, you, you are correct, the Imperial Government will be glad to, uh, to pay the costs. Now Percy is absolutely delighted. He has said nothing to Moffat about the fact that while he was still in Bulawayo, he had said to Lobengula, listen, I'm not going to pay for this out of my pocket. And the King had said, okay, we got to settle on a figure here. And they settled on 500 pounds which Lobengula gave him. Lobengula also provided the ox wagon and the ten oxen that had conveyed them thus far to, to Palapi. But now, uh, with this extra money in his pocket, <clears throat> what does uh, Percy do? He books a seat uh, for each of them on the uh, first uh, mail coach, which is going to travel further south. And um, I, I wonder what happened to the wagon with the oxen. 
I'm sure that Percy didn't just abandon them on the side of the road. So in all likelihood, he sold those as well and put that money <laughs> together with the others. So uh, it was amounting to a, a nice sizable sum. Anyway, they they get to, to Mafeking. And there it seems that the initial haste uh, that this whole mission had at the beginning uh, just evaporates. Because now Percy says, oh, I'm sure he got sick. I oh, dysentery. I had a bad case of it. No, we couldn't. We oh, definitely couldn't travel with him in, in that condition. So, uh, you know, we stayed in Mafeking for about a week or so until he recovered. And from thence, I, uh, I would assume they made their way to Freiburg, where the uh, railhead was, uh, caught a train down to Cape Town, and they were there a few days later. And when they arrive in that city, <laughs> they book themselves into the finest hotel that they can find. And uh, the next day they go and see uh, Sir Henry. And uh, he listens to these men, uh, but he's no fool. He's been in Africa a while, and he's not about to arrange a carriage to take them down to the Cape Town docks and to put them on the first ship leaving for England. So he says, uh, come back and see me tomorrow, and uh, you know we'll talk a little bit more about this. So Percy says this goes on for two weeks. Every day, he says, we go and, and, and see the, the High Commissioner, and we find out when are we going to England. And each day, he says, look, uh, you know, we'll talk about this a bit more. Finally, at the end of this uh, fortnight period, uh, Sir Henry says to them, I've got bad news. <clears throat> you guys aren't, ain't going to England. Oh, well, that is a disappointment. Why is that? He says, because uh, the Matabili have been firing on the Betjana land police. And uh, since uh, Betjana land is a protectorate of the crown, um, I mean, <laughs> Her Majesty is not going to entertain any any approach from the enemy. Um, so I don't think that uh, you can possibly uh, think that you'd be able to go there and speak to her under these circumstances. Well, Amshetti looks him in the eye and he tells him straight out, that's a lie. I don't believe that. And uh, Percy doesn't keep quiet either. And he says, uh, Sir Henry, that's an old story about the Matabili firing on the Betuana land police. That's nonsense. We've all heard that before. That was just some corporal trying to get promotion. He wanted to be made an officer and he went there with a false report about this. But uh, Sir Henry is unmoved by this. <clears throat> and, you know, between you and me, I think that probably the real reason was because these men were probably standing there tottering before him. Um, and, and he wasn't going to send them to the, to the Queen. I mean, he could just imagine Percy uh, saying to His Majesty, uh, listen, ducks, why don't you and I go for a drink and we leave these men to, to talk to your officials? Um, because that was what was going on. And Percy himself said, man, we had, a, we had a great time in Cape Town. We really did. So uh, Sir Henry Locke says, that's it, you're not going. Okay, says Percy, without too much complaint. We'll go home then. Good idea. But then, of course, uh, sir, you do realize that there is a question of expenses. I mean, surely uh, I can't be expected to pay for this out of my own pocket. Sir Henry thinks a minute and he says, okay, <clears throat> when you get to Mafeking, go and see the civil commissioner there. Um, present your account to him and he'll settle up with you. Well, that's very kind of you, sir. Thank you very much. No problem. My pleasure. Well, we'll bid you good day. And how are you? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And so they leave. When they get to Mafeking, Percy goes to see the, the civil commissioner. And uh, he says, a very good afternoon to you, sir. I, uh, you know, Sir Henry Locke sends his compliments. And he has asked me to present you with, uh, with my account. And uh, would you kindly be so, so good as to settle up with me? And he gives this man this piece of paper with all his receipts that he expects payment for. 
the commissioner looks at this and he says, this is crazy. This is a liquor bill. <laughs> I'm not going to pay this. Uh, this is nonsense. So uh, Percy says, but uh, so I, I don't think you quite understand. This is not just a liquor bill. Uh, this is a bill for, for medication. What do you mean medication? He says, oh, uh, Umsheti. You know, he's a very high official in Matabili land, uh, but he's a man who is very unhealthy and prone to fits of dysentery. And the only thing that will cure him uh, when he is in that condition, sir, is port and champagne. And, uh, you know, I've had to administer this in liberal quantities to him. Are oh, you crazy? I'm not going to pay for, for this liquor. I said, well, so we will just have to wait until the imperial government sees fit to settle up with us. And so Percy and uh, his three African friends uh, booked themselves, presumably, in the best hotel that they can find in Mafeking, and one presumably that has a good bar. Um, and it's a standoff between the civil commissioner and Percy. Who's going to give in? But hey, we can't waste our time there in Mafeking waiting for for these men to settle an argument over a liquor bill. We've got to get back to Matabili land because things are really moving over there. And you know, I can actually do myself a real favor here and, and, and you as well by just uh, keeping quiet at this point and handing over the rest of the, 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 the video to somebody who's far more accomplished and can better tell the story of this impending battle that we will be uh, looking at. And he is John Edmund. Now, we had many songwriters in Rhodesia, but surely amongst them all, uh, John Edmund has to be the crown prince. Um, I marvel at the artistic skill of this man. Can you imagine? He's taken what is, you know, largely an obscure battle. Uh, of the 1800s, uh, yeah, in the middle of Central Africa. And uh, he's researched this and he's taken the, uh, the key facts of this engagement, arranged them into lyrics and then composed a rather jaunty um, folk tune, put it all together and uh, called it the Battle of Bembezi. And it's a great song. And I wish I could just play it here for you because most of what you need to know about that battle, you will hear in that song. But uh, of course, I, I, I can't do that for all sorts of reasons. And also, it's a bit much to expect another man to do my work. But uh, when you finish watching this, uh, stay on YouTube. Uh, look up John Edmund, Battle of Bembezi, sit back, uh, close your eyes, and listen to him. Great song, really. So, now, after the Battle of uh, Shangoni, which we spoke about last time, the Matabili seemed to be moving into a forest area, and uh, Forbes was, um, was following them. But he had scouts, and amongst them was uh, an American, whom I have referred to uh, on a prior occasion uh, by the name of Frederick Burnham. And so uh, he sends them out. But Burnham doesn't go toward this forested area. Burnham heads for open country and he travels until in the distance he can see a mountain called Ntabas and Duna. And somewhere there in the vicinity he comes across a, an African village which is more or less deserted. But there are two elderly Matabili woman there and uh, Burnham engages them in conversation and the one he refers to as auntie and uh, he says to her there's not many people around here so she said no nah, everybody's sort of left so he says auntie tell me <clears throat> if I was to go from here straight to Bulawayo uh, would this be a good day for me to call upon King Lobangula no, she says, you can't do that. It certainly would not be a good time. Uh, what we've heard here is that he's getting ready to move out of Bulawayo and go northwards. Uh, as soon as his army 
comes back from the forests nearby. So he said, well, that's very interesting. And tell me, um, from here to Bulawayo, are there many warriors? No, she said. There are not many people between here and Bulawayo. It's, it's, it's like an open road, sir. Well, thank you very much for your time. And in gratitude, he gives her his pocket knife. And he turns around and uh, makes his way back to the column. And he arrives there the next day. So straight away, he goes and sees Forbes. Major, he says, we can't head for that forested area. It seems like the whole Matabili army is waiting there in ambush for us. We're going to get cut to pieces in amongst the trees there. But this way is open countryside. And uh, by all reports, there's very little uh, opposition. If we change direction and we head across this open ground, two, three days uh, maximum, we'll be in Lobangula's capital, Bulawayo. And if luck is on our side and he hasn't left yet, we can stand a, a very good chance of capturing him. So Forbes listens to all of this. It doesn't exactly suit his plans, but uh, I give him credit. He issues orders that they should change uh, the direction of march. And so they swing over into this open countryside and they proceed till they come to a place where there's some raised ground. And it's almost midday. So Forbes uh, halts the column and he says, OK, you know, form two loggers over here, uh, Salisbury logger to the north, Victoria logger to the south here. Get the uh, African auxiliaries to cut down whatever thorn trees are, are here in the area and place them between the, the wagons. And the rest of you men, it's nearly lunchtime, form up and get something to eat. But he's also sent out pickets. These are mounted uh, pairs of troopers um, and to the north, about a kilometer away, uh, are, are two men. Uh, a trooper Thompson and a trooper White. And they have stopped under a tree and dismounted and they're watching the bush. But even though they are watching, <clears throat> the Matabili still take them by surprise. These warriors materialize in front of them as though out of thin air. And before either of these men could do anything, there's warriors all around them. Poor Thompson can't move to the left or to the right or anywhere. And so in desperation to try and escape their grasp, he starts climbing one of the trees. But it's to no avail. As he's busy doing this, they start assegaiing him and they spear him and uh, he's mortally wounded, falls to the ground, and uh, momentarily, while they're busy with him, they're putting him to death. White runs uh, for his horse, jumps on it, falls off on the other side, and the animal bolts, leaving him there on, uh, on his feet. Now, everybody in the column always said that the finest athlete amongst them was Kem White. Well, that day he wasn't dressed up in any running kit. I mean, he was in uniform, uh, but he realized it was uh, his life was at stake. And so with these warriors, almost uh, within arm's uh, reach of him, he took off and he ran um, in the tracks of this galloping horse in front of him. Now, back at the lager, uh, a very sharp-eyed trooper by the name of Bill Whittaker saw this uh, riderless horse galloping toward them. And uh, in the distance, behind the horse, he could see um, Kem White uh, running for his life. And behind Kem were a number of Matabili warriors. Um, now, of course, they should have, you would think, uh, have caught him. But uh, he, was, uh, he was too good for them on his feet. But uh, Bill took a gardener gun, <clears throat> set it up, because he had noticed that uh, White was running in a straight line. And uh, he wasn't moving to the left or right. And that, that gave Bill the idea. If I shoot next to him, 
past him, I'll be able to nail those guys chasing him. And provided that uh, Kim just keeps running straight and doesn't jink left or right, I, 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 I won't hit him. And uh, this Gardner gun is a, a sort of a primitive form of machine gun, hand cranked, very reliable weapon, and uh, accurate enough for, for the job. And so as uh, White was running toward the lager, uh, Bill Whitaker opened up. Pop, 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 pop. And sure enough, uh, Kim kept to the line. He didn't. He didn't move out of uh, out of out of the, the course that he was taking, and he managed to um, get into the the lager and collapse there, totally exhausted. He'd run a splendid race, almost a kilometer, and um, but Bill had helped him a lot because he'd nailed quite a few of the pursuers. Well. By this time, there was a, a lot of commotion in the lager. I mean, with the sound of the gardener opening up, bugles started uh, sounding, uh, men stood to, uh, the idea of lunch was abandoned, everybody grabbed their weapons, and the Matabili uh, appeared about 500 yards away, advancing toward uh, the camp across some open ground. Um, the men in the Victoria Lager uh, couldn't open fire because the Salisbury Lager was um, right in the path of this advancing Matabili Impi. But Alan Wilson uh, very quickly decided that uh, he would move uh, three Maxims and a Hoskish uh, cannon over onto the, the eastern flank of the Salisbury Lager and that uh, gave some very welcome covering fire. Having seen to that, he ordered that one of the wagons be moved out of position. He jumped on his horse, called for volunteers, and set off in the direction of this approaching army. Burnham leapt on his horse, and uh, other men uh, followed suit, and this uh, small uh, group of mounted men charged at the Matabili. Well, when they were about 200 meters away, Wilson reined in his horse, and Burnham heard him, heard him say, Good Lord, there are thousands of them. And there before them stretched this uh, remarkable spectacle. Uh, almost a mile from one end to the other was the Matabili battle formation. And this was uh, in the shape of a, of a buffalo's head with the horns on either flank. And it was moving toward them, and it seemed like nothing on earth would be able to stop them. But um, even though uh, the, there was rifle fire, and the Maxims had now found the range, and they had opened up, there was always one man in the column who was never found wanting. Uh, and one could always depend upon him, and that was uh, Charlie Lendy. And he very quickly seized up the situation, uh, took a Hoskis cannon, seven pounder, uh, pulled it to one side of the lager, and then uh, boom, he sent a shell over onto the left flank of the advancing Matabili army. And it landed right on target. And of course, it uh, just um, caused devastation uh, um, when it burst there. High explosive, shrapnel, and uh, warriors fell all around, uh, so much so that the disturbance of that shell landing amongst them sent some of them, uh, they broke the line and they headed off toward the Bembezi River. The cannon was repositioned and fired again, boom, the time onto the right horn, hit the mark again with the same result. And then Charlie moved the cannon so that it would, uh, it could bring it to bear on the, the head of the buffalo. Boom, boom, boom. Three shells dropped right there, again on the mark. And this brought the whole regiment to a stop. <clears throat> they were dead and dying everywhere. Um, and above the noise of battle, <clears throat> the cries of the wounded and the dying men, and the sounds of uh, gunfire, uh, could be heard cries of alarm from the Victoria lager. 
And what had happened was that the horses had escaped. And a very uh, gallant young boer by the name of Pitt Matthiessen had managed to exercise some sort of control over part of that stampeding herd. And he had brought uh, those horses back into the lager and, and good for him. But the greater bulk of these animals uh, bolted off uh, running straight uh, toward the west into the arms of another impi that was waiting there in the bush. And uh, it was a, a very dangerous situation because if uh, the column lost its horses, you can imagine for yourself, men uh, without steeds in Central Africa outnumbered uh, hundreds, if not thousands to one, they wouldn't stand a chance. It would be just a question of time before they'd be overwhelmed by the enemy. So uh, something had to be done. And uh, Captain Henry Borrow uh, got onto a horse, um, galloped out to try and steer these horses away from the, the Matabili warriors. And he was followed by a very um, plucky gentleman uh, by the name of Sir John Willoughby, riding majestically, steering his horse with his knees, revolver in either hand, and uh, shooting away at any Matabili that got in his way. And these two men, with others following them, managed to turn the horses away from uh, the waiting impi, southwards uh, back down toward the Bembezi River. Now, these horses had had quite a bit of a run. <laughs> and uh, when they saw the water, uh, thankfully, what did they do? Uh, stuck their, their legs out, uh, came to a stop, put their, uh, their faces in the water and, and started drinking. So it took all the energy out of the stampede, which was a good thing. But the Matabili had now recovered from that uh, initial uh, setback that they had and they launched uh, another assault and they came pretty close this time even though um, they were sweeping gunfire uh, across their front uh, a huge man later on they heard he was the king's executioner fell about a um, hundred paces from uh, the front line of the the lager and um, behind him his son was also killed uh, and Lendy did his job again. Boom on the one flank, boom on the other flank, boom, boom, boom in the centre. And again, the uh, the Matabili army hesitated and, and, and were brought to a stop. And again, they resumed the assault. And again, Lendy repeated his tactics. But this time, it seemed that the, um, the Matabili had changed their strategy. Instead of pressing home the attack, they started firing up into the sky. And one imagines that they must have thought, well, if we hit one of the artillery shells, it'll explode in the air and it won't do so much damage amongst us. Um, but the, the crazy thing was that when the shells did land amongst them, not only did they stop shooting into the sky, they started shooting at the bomb burst. And goodness knows how many of their own people they killed with that. And later on, when prisoners were brought in, uh, they were asked, what on earth did you do that for? Uh, why do you shoot at the bomb blasts? And nobody could give an answer. They weren't sure themselves. I suppose somebody saw somebody doing that and thought, well, if they're doing that, I better do it as well. But it was uh, one of the strange things that happened on the battlefield that day. But the fight was out of the Matabili at that point. And uh, they just rose to their feet, even the bullets were still whizzing around them, turned their backs on the column and just uh, walked off the field. One officer described it. He said there was no order to it. They just wandered off as though they were disinterested. And he said a great many of them looked quite sulky about it all. Another strange reaction that took place amongst the Matabili that day was that after the battle, uh, many of these warriors hung themselves in nearby trees. And um, so there was quite a few things happening that day that really astonished uh, 
the survivors of, of that battle. But um, so quickly did things return to normality that within about half an hour, a herd of zebra appeared out of the bush and seeing their cousins standing at the side of the Bimbisi River after their stampede, decided, well, we will also have something to drink. And so there was this lovely African scene of tranquility with these uh, wild animals drinking water there in the river. The troopers um, went around collecting whatever Martini Henrys had been discarded by the Matabili. And that was quite ironical because these weapons had been given to Lobangula by Cecil Rhodes um, I suppose largely as a, as a token of friendship and peace, yeah, but they'd been used in battle now. So a number of those were recovered. And uh, of course, uh, they tried to tally up the dead. <clears throat> and it seemed that there were approximately 1,500 Matabili that died on the battlefield. One doesn't know how many were wounded and died later. So... Uh, the loss to the Matabili nation uh, ran into uh, probably a couple of thousand at least, if not more. On our side, well, of course, poor Thompson, who had been speared in the tree, was buried on the battlefield. Um, the next day, two troopers succumbed to their wounds, and a few days later, a fourth man. So f four men killed, seven wounded. And uh, no written record of the number of African auxiliaries that may have been wounded or lost their lives. It seems probable that there were no losses amongst the auxiliaries. As soon as the fighting started, they, um, they gathered in the lager. And unless there was a stray bullet or two from the, from the enemy, uh, I think we can safely assume that there were no casualties amongst them. So it was a good day. For the column, uh, statistically wise, um, later on, that uh, particular area became a farm, and it was known as White's Run Farm. And <laughs> if I must fast forward to modern Zimbabwe, and I think of the land grabbing that took place there, I can just picture some very angry Zanu officials driving along the road and, and seeing a sign whites run farm <laughs> and uh, thinking that this is a farm that uh, is so blatantly and provocatively advertised as being run by Europeans <laughs> but uh, of course it wasn't it was just uh, a farm named after that magnificent run of Kem White so this was the decisive battle of the Matabili war uh, there was open countryside now uh, from there to Bulawayo and um, I, I think we'll just uh, we'll just leave it there, and we've got we've got to get back down to to Mafeking because we we can't finish the movie and leave uh, Percy there. So we need to go and see what's happening there. Well, after a week, the commissioner realised that uh, Percy wasn't going to move. So he uh, and also the longer he stayed, the more the commissioner would have to pay. So he called him in and he said, "All right." <clears throat> Uh, what do we owe you? Let's get this uh, over and done with. Uh, and Percy told him, and uh, the man settled up with him. So from there, they travelled up to Palapi, and uh, of course, what does Percy do? He goes to see uh, John Moffat. Uh, Mr. Moffat, the High Commissioner has asked me to speak to you, and uh, if there's any balance to my uh, expenses, uh, he indicated that you would uh, you would pay these. Now Moffat is not in the mood for a discussion or an argument about money. Said, what do we owe you? He said, well, the imperial government owes me whatever it was. So Moffat pays him. And now, you know, you, you can imagine, Percy is, is doing okay, eh? So uh, he, he calls these African buddies together and he says, <clears throat> listen, my good friends, you know, we've been gone a long time, and which is true, they had, uh, over four months. Now, uh, granted that travel in those days was a lot slower than, than it is today, 
but still, uh, they should have <laughs> they should have been back in Bulawayo long ago. But uh, he says, do, do you think that you could make your own way home um, from here? They said, yeah, sure, from here, Tati, Tati, Bulawayo, Bulawayo, we're home, no sweat. So he says, yeah, you know, <clears throat> I'm sure that whatever fighting is going to take place there is probably finished by now, and you'll probably find everything is quite peaceful, and besides, I'm sure you guys want to see your families. I, I'd love to come with, but there's a couple of things that I need to see to first. But uh, I, I, will, I will be returning to Bulawayo, and um, I'll see you there. They said, no problem. Um, we'll see you later. And Percy said, you're fine. We'll catch you in Bulawayo. So they part company. And then Percy uh, takes some of his money, and he buys a buggy with two horses, and he sets out for Maklutsi. And when he gets there, he acquires two wagons with their teams, and he loads these things up with store goods. And uh, now he's ready also to make, a, make his way back to Bulawayo. Uh, and he knows that the stuff he's got in the wagons are going to be in short supply in Bulawayo. And he's expecting to, to really do well for himself. <laughs> and, uh, and he's been financed in all of this by the imperial government. Uh, so, so good for good for Percy, and um, we will speak more about him. We won't uh, we won't forget him entirely. Uh, he and his brothers, uh, they made a significant mark on uh, early Rhodesia. So uh, uh, we'll speak some more about Percy. But I think what we'll do is we'll we'll stop right here. We won't go on any further. Uh, certainly, the Matabili War wasn't over. Uh, there was still a lot of fighting left to do and a lot of interesting things taking place at Bulawayo and, we, and we'll talk about those next time. So uh, folks, thank you very kindly for your patience and for, for listening to the history of my country and uh, take care. I'm going to put on something warm in a moment and then I've got to go out there in that bad weather. But that's okay. I, I don't mind a bit. Um, and until we meet again, uh, the Lord bless you and cheers.